Okay, so in this lecture I want to talk about abiotic characteristics of tropical ecosystems and in particular looking at soils. Now this fits into the uh, course because I want to talk about controls on ecosystem function and ecosystem type on a more local scale. So I've already talked about controls of climate and things like rainfall and average annual temperature on ecosystem type. But now I want to talk about some abi abiotic um, parameters which influence an ecosystem type on a more local scale. So because soils vary uh, much more rapidly across a landscape, so a soil at the top of a hill may be very different to the soil at a valley bottom, for instance. The ecosystem types which soils will control vary over a much shorter distance than, say, uh, climate type and so on. So this is soils, uh, the ecosystem, the abiotic parameter which controls ecosystem type and e ecosystem functioning over a short area um, and I will also be doing a lecture on fire which also does that. So in this lecture, oh by the way, I'm, this is just one lecture on soil and how soil controls tropical ecosystems. Uh, those of you who are doing natural resource management um, would have done a whole course on soil, so you're going to get this in much greater detail. I want to give you this course just to bring you up to date on what I want you to know about soils and how soils influence ecosystems. Um, you're likely to get this in a much greater detail if you are doing the ENRM major. Okay, so hopefully this will be a a refresher course for you. So in this lecture what I want to take a look at is some of the importance of tropical soils, some of the factors which I think um, is most important when we talk about ecosystem functioning, why we get a particular ecosystem, rainforest and so on in a particular place and um, how those characteristics influence the uh, tropical ecosystem. I want to talk about how climate overall influence a tropical rainforest soil, uh, nutrient cycling in tropical rainforest soils, how it's distinct and different uh, to say temperate systems. I want to take a look at some of the organisms in nutrient cycling, things like nitrogen fixes and mycorrhiza. I want to talk about leaching, the dominant process in tropical soils. Uh, and I want to take a look at how soil fertility influences rainforest characteristics. And finally, taking a look at soil drainage and how that influences tropical rainforests. So, first of all, the importance of tropical soils. Okay, now as I said before, um, there are about three main things which influence a plant in any given environment and that would be uh, the amount of moisture that it has, the temperature that it's growing at, and finally also the nutrients which it's uh, using. So nutrients are almost exclusively uh, delivered to the plant through the soils. Um, the soils, by their physical structure and so on, will also control things like drainage, whether or not the plant gets flooded, and also whether or not the plant will get a particular supply of water. Okay, so if uh, soil is very uh, well drained, then it may dry out during um, parts of the year and so on. Okay, now um, this slide should really be titled the uh, first slide on climate and characteristics of tropical soils. Um, but 
I just want to use it to emphasize that tropical soils are important to tropical rainforests. Um, so I'll just change that to climate and tropical soils. Okay. Now there are two main differences between the main ecosystems in the tropics. Savannas and dry forests tend to have um, soils called alpha soils and rainforests tend to have uh, soils which are called eutosols and oxazols. Now the main reason for the difference of those two soils is the amount of leaching which goes on in those soils. Because rainforests have a very wet environment, uh, water constantly available, there tends to be a net downward movement of water in the soil profile. The net downward movement of water in the soil profile has a big impact in the development of that soil. The first most noticeable thing about these types of soils is that they are very deeply weathered. So in a tropical rainforest ecosystem, you may not find a lot of uh, fresh rock or rock outcrop exposed. If you look around Trinidad and Tobago, there's not many places where you would find um, fresh rock exposed. Most of that rock is weathered. Okay, It tends to be weathered because there is large amounts of water around warm temperatures. So the breakdown or the weathering, the chemical reactions which uh, break down those rocks proceed very quickly. That means that the top few meters of any sort of land surface tends to be very much weathered, very weathered over a, a long period of time. So the weathered profile tends to be very deep. That means the B horizon of a tropical soil, uh, tropical rainforest soil profile tends to be very deep. It also means that um, tropical rainforest soils tend to be very leached and because of that they have some features which shows uh, a great amount of leeches, a leaching and that is um, they are very high in kaolinite clays and very high in iron and aluminium oxides. The aluminium and um, iron oxides are what gives a tropical rainforest soil. It's typically yellow and red or orangey color. Um, the reason why rainforest soils tends to be high in kaolinite clays and iron and aluminium oxides is because the leaching removes most of the other components of a weathered rock further down into the profile. Savannas and dry forests which tend to have less leaching because of the less rainfall, tend to be less high in um, the eutazoles and oxazoles, less high in the kaolinite clays and um, iron and aluminium oxides. And they, as consequence, they tend to be less uh, orange and red, okay? Less intensely leached. Um, we're going to concentrate on rainforest soils and nutrient cycling in this lecture because we are looking at rainforests and rainforest management. So we're going to concentrate on rainforests. So some of the main influences on tropical rainforest soils are the warm temperatures and high rainfall. As I said before, warm temperatures and high rainfall mean that tropical soils or tropical land surfaces are very deeply weathered and that weathering occurs very rapidly. 
So if you were to dig down into a tropical rainforest soil, you'd probably have to go down several meters before you started getting into what is known as the sea horizon, where you find fragments and mixed up parts of the unweathered rock and even further before you get down to the fresh um, basement rock. It also means that um, the O and the A horizon are quite thin. Now the O horizon is the undecomposed humus, the detrital layer, and the A horizon is the mixed humus and um, well, the decomposing organic matter. Um, both of these layers are very thin in tropical rainforest soils because decomposition proceeds at a very rapid rate. Okay, so the A, the O horizon, sorry, is not humus. It's actually undecomposed organic matter and then the A horizon is humus um, mixed in also with a bit of mineral soil. Both of these layers are very thin because decom decomposition occurs very quickly. So the, de the organic matter never hangs around very much. It's broken down very quickly and returned to um, inorganic or mineral forms very quickly. Conversely, the B horizon tends to be very thick. It extends to quite a depth because of the rapid and uh, large amount of weathering. But it also uh, is fairly uh, thick because a lot of the um, clays and other material is leached down into the B horizon. Now leaching is the dominant process in tropical rainforest soils. There is a predominantly downward vertical movement of water. And that means that all of the minerals and all of the material in a tropical rainforest soil, um, which is liable to move with that movement of water, um, will be, as it's called, leached down in the soil profile. And that includes many mineral nutrients, particularly the mineral nutrients which are dissolved in soil solution. And plants have evolved to uptake their nutrients from that soil solution. So this leaching of minerals in the soil is very important. Um, it means that uh, in a tropical rainforest soil, nutrients which the plants need and use are very liable to be lost from the rooting zone of the uh, forest through leaching very quickly. And that means that um, plants and animals have evolved to try and prevent that to happen. Okay, so here's a general um, a general soil profile. Um, it doesn't have the O horizon but that's a thin layer on top of the profile which is all the undecomposed organic matter, all the leaf litter and, and so on. The A horizon is the horizon where you would have the uh, humus, the semi-decomposed organic matter mixed in with some mineral soil and it tends to be very leached as says there. That's because there is a net downward movement of water and the nutrients or which are released by the decom decomposing matter tends to be lost. Okay. So the B horizon is the horizon uh, where all that leached material accumulates, the nutrients tend to be lost out of the system and into groundwater. 
the sea horizon is the transition between the weathered material and the bedrock and the bedrock is finally underlying everything. Okay. Most of the nutrients in a tropical rainforest soil exist within the top few centimeters within the um, O horizon and the A horizon, mainly in the A horizon where the organic material is being weathered and the nutrients being released. So some of the characteristics of tropical rainforest soils. Um, inputs of nutrients from fresh bedrock is very negligible. Most bi biotic activity occurs in the top few centimeters and the majority of nutrients in a tropical rainforest is in the biomass. Okay, so compared to a temperate ecosystem uh, which would quite often get a lot of input of fresh uh, nutrients, um, tropical rainforests, because of their deep weathering profile, uh, which means that fresh bread rock and the weathering front of a land surface is at quite a large depth, it means that the fresh release or the the weathering of fresh bedrock occurs a long way away from the rooting zone of plants and that means that you're not really going to get release of nutrients which the plants can access very quickly. So because of that nutrients um, are not constantly inputted into a tropical rainforest. Also, the, where the weathering front is, where the nutrients are being released, is at the wrong end of that, new, that leaching gradient, which goes from top to bottom. So the nutrients don't, are not able to migrate against that downward movement of water. So nutrients uh, from fresh bedrock weathering tends to be isolated and not accessible to the plants in a tropical rainforest. Because of this, most of the nutrients which are available to uh, tropical rainforest plants are from decomposed matter. Okay? So the decomposing organic matter provides the main source of nutrients and that decomposing organic matter is concentrated in the top few centimeters of the soil in a tropical rainforest. Because there are no restrictions um, in terms of temperature and moisture and water for plant growth, um, plant growth tends to be very, very rapid and the limiting factor on plant growth therefore in a tropical rainforest does tend to be the nutrients in the soil. So a plant will grow um, with the warm temperatures and the presence of moisture continuously unless it's limited by lack of nutrients uh, which is generally the case. So competition for nutrients in uh, a tropical rainforest, it tends to be very intense. Plants want to grab a hold of those nutrients so that they can grow. So that means they would uh, invest a lot in trying to get those nutrients. Okay. So that means that nutrients, when they are released from decomposing uh, vegetation will tend to be taken up very quickly by the roots and by um, decomposers and um, very rapidly and, and seldom left on their own. Um, that means that nutrients and decomposing organic matter uh, tends to occur up in the top few centimeters of the soil profile and the nutrients 
are never left alone to be leached into the other parts of the soil profile. So most biotic activity and most nutrients in a tropical rainforest soil will tend to be in the top few centimeters of the soil profile. Because nutrients tend to be very limiting on primary productivity, the majority of nutrients that you find in a tropical rainforest will tend to be found in the biomass. So the nutrients are, um, at an, in a mature tropical rainforest will be transferred from the soils into the biomass. Okay, so uh, all those nutrients would have been taken up and used for growth and basically sucked out of the soil pool and incorporated into the biomass. And this leads to, leads to the paradigm that most tropical rainforest soils will tend to be low in nutrients and relatively infertile. Okay, Now, research work has been done which shows that tropical rainforest soils do tend to have the same range of fertility as temperate soils, so they'll be like fertile um, high nutrient rainforest soils in say places like alluvial plains and and so on and there will be very low nutrient rainforest soils in uh, places like uh, old weathered surfaces and uplands and so on so for instance the Guyana shield and the white sand forests on the Guyana shield are very low in nutrients um, but uh, the soils around the floodplain of the Amazon River can be very high in nutrients. Okay, but generally in equivalent land surfaces, uh, tropical rainforest soils tend to be lower in nutrients, mainly because those nutrients have been taken up by the biomass. So nutrient cycling in tropical rainforest soils therefore is very tight. Okay? Rainfall is a big factor both in promoting um, decomposition and also in providing a downward movement of water which um, uh, gives you a constant threat of leaching in the tropical soil profile. So the cycling tends to be very tight and very rapid. Uh, dead organic matter does not build up. Okay, it's constantly being decomposed and nutrients are being constantly released from that decomposition of dead organic matter. DOM means dead organic matter. So plants and decomposers in a tropical rainforest must rapidly take up those nutrients. And it's interesting that um, even though there is a constant danger of leaching of nutrients from a tropical rainforest, in a mature tropical rainforest environment, nutrients um, which run off from a tropical rainforest tend to be very low. So it means that the biota uh, which takes up that nutrients once um, it's released from dead, or dead organic matter decomposition uh, is very efficient at taking up that, uh, those nutrients. And the first line in nutrient cycling after dead organic matter has decomposed are uh, the decomposers. Uh, first you have the mechanical decomposers who break down the leaves and the, the small twigs and the branches and the trunks of trees and so on. Um, and they tend to be arthropods like cockroaches, millipedes, um, larvae of beetles and so on. And you would have the chemical decomposers, uh, the fungi and the bacteria who will take the fragments and convert them chemically and derive um, energy from converting those uh, or that organic matter into more mineral or inorganic um, nutrients. 
Termites are a very successful decomposer in most environments, including tropical rainforests, and they use both mechanical and chemical means. Um, they would use uh, mechanical means by means of um, chewing and um, being able to um, eat out and break down uh, dead organic matter, and they would use chemical means by use of uh, microbes in their gut to break down that dead organic matter. So the dead organic matter is broken down to humus and made available for plant uptake again. All well, the nutrients in the dead organic matter are made available for plant uptake once again. Now most of those nutrients can only be available to the plant when they are dissolved in soil solution. So those nutrients will tend to be uh, taken up by a chain of decompos uh, decomposers. So one uh, decom decomposer will uh, take one, what they need from the dead organic matter and their, um, their excretions or um, their uh, leavings will be taken up by a next um, decomposer and so the dead organic matter will be passed from one decomposer to the next down a chain until the nutrients are released into the soil water dissolved in the soil water now if the if those nutrients are not taken up from the soil water very quickly they are liable to be leached out of the system down through the soil profile and into the groundwater and lost to the biota within the ecosystem so those nutrients dissolved in soil water tend to be taken up very quickly by plants and also by um, other organisms. Where nutrients are particularly limiting in uh, a forest, the roots um, and associated, uh, micro, um, associated microbes, which do a lot of the uptake of nutrients, tend to be concentrated at the top of the soil profile in the A horizon, where all these nutrients have been released from decomposition. A very important um, part of the scavenging of this released nutrients, which is vulnerable to leaching, are mycorrhizal fungi. Now mycorrhizal fungi um, are fungi which have a partnership with the higher plants, including the trees and the shrubs in the tropical rainforest. Now the trees and the shrubs are very good at photosynthesis. They can grow very tall, they can capture the light, they can utilize the abundant water, and so put on a lot of primary productivity. And as I said previously, they will tend to be limited more by nutrients. Now my, um, mycorrhizal fungi um, enter into a partnership with these higher plants. They can utilize the photosynthates which the, um, these higher plants uh, generate through photosynthesis and they'll take these carbohydrates and they will extend their networks and because they can grow very rapidly so the cost of producing a, high, a fungal hyphae is much much cheaper than uh, a very complex root of a vascular plant. Uh, it means that fungal hyphae get everywhere and they can very massively increase the surface area of the forest which a uh, higher plant has access to. So the mycorrhizal fungi will infect the roots of the plants of the, high, the higher plants and they effectively they will plug into the roots of the higher plants and nutrients will be transferred from the fungi into the roots of the higher plant. And this is 
very important for higher plants, particularly in low nutrient environments. It's actually um, the um, in low nutrient um, forests, which tend to be the majority of tropical forests, uh, mycorrhizal nutrient uh, mycorrhizal uh, fungi are extremely important uh, for the higher plants in taking up nutrients and in particular phosphorus tends to be one of the most limiting nutrients in a tropical rainforest because it is a geochemical nutrient which can only be found from decomposing bedrock and as I said before decomposing bedrock is always a long way away from the biota and so the phosphorus is in particularly limiting supply. Mycorrhizae and their hyphal networks tend to be uh, very uh, comprehensive in their ability to take up nutrients from around the, um, so the A horizon and in particularly the, the phosphorus. So uh, mycorrhizal fungi, just to give you an idea of how much uh, surface area of the forest they are able to um, incorporate. Some of the largest known living organisms um, on land are actually these mycorrhizal fungi. So um, scientists doing uh, DNA profiling of a of a mycorrhizal fungi in a tropical rainforest found that uh, a single mycorrhizal fungal colony can extend over several hectares and weigh many hundreds of tons um, estimated biomass a tropical rainforest ecosystem okay so mycorrhizal fungi are very important in the nutrient cycling in a tropical forest so much so that practically every, um, well, yeah, practically every species of uh, rainforest tree in a tropical forest tends to have mycorrhizal partnerships with um, uh, fungi. Bacteria are also very important when it comes to nutrient cycling. Um, particular types of bacteria which are very important are the nitrogen fixes and I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Bacteria also can be in competition with plants uh, in taking up nutrients and in particular low nutrient rainforests uh, bacteria can be suppressed by plant exudates uh, so things like uh, chemicals which are released by leaves or chemicals which are in the dead decomposing matter of leaves of plants and so on are actually designed to suppress uh, these bacteria which may take up nutrients in preference to plants from the soil water and so on but probably the most important bacteria in the tropical forest is the rhizobium bacteria uh, which fixes nitrogen now you've probably all heard about uh, rhizobiums and nitrogen fixes. Now these are very important in pretty much all ecosystems. They um, have the ability to convert nitrogen from the atmosphere into dissolved um, forms which can dissolve in water. So from um, nitrogen gas nitrogen fixes uh, will take that gas and they'll convert it into uh, nitrates and nitrites and ammonia which can dissolve in water and so be accessible to higher plants. Now higher plants um, and rhizobium bacteria have evolved to um, form symbiotic partnerships where the uh, higher plants again as with the mycorrhizal associations 
the higher plants will provide photosynthates, carbohydrates from um, photosynthetic reactions to the rhizobium bacteria which would live in nodules on the plant roots. So the plants would also provide an environment for the rhizobium bacteria to live. Now these rhizobium bacteria need an anoxic environment or a low oxygen environment to carry out their uh, nitrogen reduction reactions. So they will colonize a root of a plant and the plant will form nodules around these rhizobium bacteria and within those nodules the environment will be a low oxygen environment. So the rhizobium bacteria will fix the nitrogen and convert it into nitrites, nitrates and ammonia. plant will be able to take up those uh, that form of nitrogen and in return the plant will provide carbohydrates to the rhizobium bacteria. When um, It's interesting to note that when soil fertility um, rises above a certain critical level um, both the symbioses which um, the higher plants enter into with the mycorrhizal fungi and with the rhizobium bacteria um, to gain nutrients quite often those symbioses are rejected so the roots of the higher plant will um, basically as it were throw out the mycorrhizal fungi and the nitrogen okay because they don't need the uptake of um, nutrients anymore and they just don't want to pay the carbohydrate costs for that uh, uptake of nutrients whether it be phosphorus or whether it be nitrogen so that depending on the soil fertility the importance of the symbioses is greater or lesser So these nitrogen fixes um, are often, um, they can be free living um, as well as being in uh, symbiosis with the higher plants. Uh, quite often there is algae, usually blue-green blue algae, um, sometimes in epiphyllous lichen association. So you would get a substantial amount of um, nitrogen fixing from blue-green algae uh, growing on as lichens on the surfaces of leaves in the tropical rainforest. And that nitrogen would be inputted into the rest of the ecosystem when those leaves die and fall to the forest floor and are decomposed. Right. Let, I want to talk a little bit more about leaching because leaching is very important uh, in a tropical forest and if you are managing a tropical forest it's one of the main reasons why you don't want to leave the tropical soils exposed to any great length of time because leaching will take over and remove a lot of the nutrients from that tropical soil. So the potential of leaching of nutrients in a tropical forest soil is very high and there are certain abiotic factors which favor leaching and primary among those are the high downward vertical movements of water but also the ability of the soil to hold uh, nutrients which are dissolved in soil water solution this is known as um, the CEC and the AEC of soils CEC is the cation exchange capacity of the soils and AEC is the anion exchange capacity of the soils. Now they tend to be fairly low in tropical rainforest soils uh, mainly because um, of the pH balance of the soils. Okay, now this is a fairly complex um, 
set of reactions, but let me try and explain it to you. Um, each soil particle has a certain amount of um, loose ends, as it were, in their crystal molecular matrix. And those loose ends will tend to have a charge on them. It will be a positive charge or a negative charge. So those um, loose ends form uh, charge sites which will tend to attract the ions of the nutrients in solution. So for instance a phosphorus molecule will have a positive charge on its surface and so if it encounters a negatively charged soil particle surface it will bind loosely to that soil particle surface. Okay, So that phosphorus nutrient with its positive charge will be held electrostatically onto the soil surface. Now the plant roots through uh, their uptake of nutrients in the soil um, solution are able to remove that nutrient from the soil surface and take it up into the roots. Okay, So these electrostatically um, bound, loosely bound nutrient, part, uh, nutrient molecules are bound to the soil particle surface. Okay, and this is a very important measure, as it were, of uh, fertility of soils. If uh, soil particles, if a soil has, um, and the soil particles in that soil have high amounts of sites, charge sites on their surface, so they can hold large amounts of um, nutrient molecules in the soil solution on their surface, then that soil is said to have a high cation exchange capacity or anion exchange capacity. What this means is that these nutrient molecules are less vulnerable to leaching. So because they're held loosely onto the soil uh, particle surface, they're much less likely to be leached. Okay? The the nutrients, the nutrient molecules are still available to the plant roots. They, the plant roots can still take up those nutrients, but the nutrients are not vulnerable to leaching. So having a high cation exchange capacity or a high anion exchange capacity is a good thing for a soil. And when it's measured, it means that that soil can potentially be very fertile. Tropical rainforest ecosystems tend to have low cation exchange capacities and anion exchange capacities. The reason why they tend to have low cation exchange capacity is because of the acidity of tropical soils. Now tropical soils tend to be very acidic. And the reason why they tend to be very acidic is because of the very high rates of decomposition of the leaf litter. Because there's high temperatures or warm temperatures and large amounts of water around, decomposition and the activity of uh, decomposers is very rapid. Okay, and a lot going on. So these decom decomposers are animals and that means they will tend to respire. That respiration evolves uh, carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide will dissolve in the water, um, the soil water, and react with the water molecules to form a weak carbonic acid. So there is always a large amount, a, a relatively large amount of hydrogen ions floating around in the soil water from that reaction. 
So the CO2 reacts with the water to form um, carbonic acid, uh, which consists of hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbon uh, carbonate um, molecules. Those hydrogen ions will bind on to the um, charged sites on the soil surface preferentially uh, compared to the nutrients and they will displace the nutrients or they will block the nutrients binding to the soil site so the charged sites on the soil mole, um, particle surface that means that these nutrients will be less likely to be held against leaching okay so the low uh, cation exchange capacity of tropical rainforest soils because of the high decomposition and because of the low pH or the acidity of the soil solution means that CEC processes which are very important in holding on to uh, nutrient molecules in tropical soils are simply not as effective in a tropical rainforest so you would tend to get more leaching in a tropical rainforest soil that compared to say a temperate rainforest soil there are some abiotic factors which mitigate against leaching okay so the higher downward movements of water and the low CEC and AEC tend to uh, create a situation where you get lots of leaching you would also get abiotic factors mitigating against leaching. Um, one of those um, factors would be uh, PEDs and large megapore spaces. So tropical forest soils are not homogeneous masses of soils. Quite often they form these large concretions or PEDs and around these PEDs there will be spaces and these would be large uh, pore spaces. Drainage of water from the ecosystem would occur mainly through these large spaces around the concretions of soil and within those PEDs the soil solution, the soil water will be protected against the downward movement of water. Okay, so nutrients would be protected by concentrating drainage away from where the nutrients are in the middle of the PEDs around the edges of the PEDs okay so in that way um, leaching of nutrients would be less likely okay so I mean those are some of the dominant processes in tropical soils uh, which I wanted to tell you about. Um, now I just want to talk a little bit about how soil fertility can influence the characteristics of a forest and I've got a list of characteristics of um, uh, low fertility soil vegetation. So what does a forest look like which grows on a generally low nutrient or low fertility soil. So the forest will tend not to be able to grow as tall. It will generally be stunted in stature. Uh, the trees would, because they're smaller, they can grow closer together. So there'll be more smaller stems of trees. The leaves of the trees will tend to be very thick and what is known as sclerophyllous okay that's thick and leathery uh, they're thick and sclerophyllous because the trees will want to try and retain those leaves for as long as possible okay because nutrients are very limiting it means that the plants are less able or well, less willing to let go of those nutrients so they will try and hang on to their biomass as long as possible including the leaves okay so the leaves will be protected with lots of fibers 
and lots of chemicals and be very thick and resistant to both physical damage and also damage from herbivores. So a thick fibrous leaf is not going to be very tasty for a herbivore. Okay, so those leaves will be protected by being thick and leathery and not very palatable and also being able to resist ripping and tearing by being physically bashed around by the wind and so on. So leaves tend to be thick and sclerophyllous or leathery on low nutrient soils. You tend to have more roots in a low fertility forest. Okay, so the um, amount of effort in nutrient gathering which is represented by the root biomass tends to be relatively higher in a low fertility soil. The roots are also concentrated in the area where nutrients are most likely to be found which is at the site of decomposition of the dead organic matter. So roots will form mats on top of the soil in the forest. The diversity of the forests and the number of uh, species tends to be highest on intermediate fertility soils. So it's one of those paradoxes. Uh, you, would have, you would expect the highest diversity, highest number of uh, species of trees to be found on the highest fertility soils. But it seems that um, in a very high fertility, uh, a soil fertility forest, you would tend to find species which specialize in being able to utilize that unusually high uh, levels of nutrients and they will be able to outcompete the other species of trees and so depress the diversity of the forests. And by the same token, on very low diversity forests, uh, you would tend to find um, only those species who could cope with that low diversity and had these characteristics of stunting sclerophyllous leaves and high root shoot ratio. Okay, So you would tend to find that the highest diversity of forests on those intermediate fertility soils, the soils which tend to have uh, fertility which is in the middle range. So very high fertility soils will tend to support low diversity forests and very low fertility soils will te also tend to have low diversity forests. Right, so I've talked a lot about nutrients but there's also other edaphic or soil influence on forest characteristics and characteristics of forests with high levels of soil moisture uh, can have a dramatic influence on uh, tropical forests or soil drainage. Um, when you would, when you talk about soil moisture, generally it's a good thing, and forests and primary productivity will tend to increase. Uh, the height of the forest, the size of the biomass, will tend to increase with increasing moisture levels in the soil. But eventually there will be too much water and the forest will become waterlogged. The roots will become drowned and they won't be able to uptake nutrients anymore because they don't have enough oxygen. And that's when a soil becomes waterlogged. And that's when primary productivity will decrease because the roots simply cannot access. They cannot breathe so they cannot access the nutrients and even the water. So stature will increase with moisture levels until water logging occurs. Diversity will increase um, with moisture levels until the uh, soil is waterlogged. So when you get waterlogged soils you will get um, types of forests called initially swamp forests and marsh forests and eventually you would get um, continuously waterlogged soil where you would only get herbaceous vegetation. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, 
Forests can also grow on toxic soils, soils which have uh, very high levels of nasty nutrients like iron and nickel and magnesium. Um, so the ultramafic soils would be the soils with very high levels of magnesium. And those high levels of magnesium can be very toxic, which means that the roots are poisoned. So those uh, types of forests will show all the characteristics of a low nutrient type of forest. And these types of um, ultramafic forests can be very important in places like Jamaica and in parts of, the, of Tobago as well. The diversity of vegetation tends to be very low because only certain species can deal with these very toxic soils. Only certain species have evolved the mechanisms to deal with it. A little bit more on soil drainage and ecosystem type. Um, swamp and marsh forests have drastically reduced stature and uh, specialized species. Okay. Let me go on and show you some pictures to end the lecture. Here is a normal tropical forest where the drainage tends to be impeded. So there may be a clay layer under the surface or a high water table. Maybe on the coast you would tend to find this swamp forest. So part, at least part of the year the roots are flooded and during the dry season the water table may go down and primary productivity to continue. But because primary productivity is restricted during part of the year, the stature of the trees and the so on will be much less. The end point of uh, drainage uh, being impeded would be a place like the Aripo savanna. The Aripo savanna during the wet season is almost completely flooded but during the dry season it dries out completely. So primary productivity is restricted during the wet season due to flooding and during the dry season to complete lack of water. So in places where the drainage is impeded only a few centimeters under the surface you simply can't get any woody plant growth. And it's only when the um, clay layer which uh, causes this drainage impedance uh, tends to break up or go lower into the surface that you can get woody vegetation and that's the swamp forest that or the marsh forest that you can see um, on the boundary in this picture of these savannas. Okay so I'll leave that lecture there. Um, hopefully you found it somewhat interesting it's not something which uh, is a full course. There are lots about um, tropical forest soils which I haven't touched on. Hopefully you'll be able to uh, pick those up in, uh, in your readings. Okay, so it's fairly critical that you do read uh, on tropical forest soils and fertilities and so on and some of the dominant processes. The things which I want you to take away from this lecture are first of all tropical forest soils are very important. Okay, They vary on a lower scale or a smaller scale than climate variations. They can influence the type of ecosystem that you get some of the dominant processes in tropical rainforest soils are leaching. Nutrients can tend to um, be rejected or sorry lost from an ecosystem through leaching and in low fertility soils uh, there are mechanisms to try and hang on to those nutrients. Okay thank you very much. Uh, I will be back with you with a lecture on fire shortly.